My name is Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. If uh, your group is not a member of UNAC, I hope you'll join us. You can go to our website, which is unacpeace.org, and uh, become a member. We're a coalition of peace and justice groups um, in the United States. Uh, we have, besides our website, on our website, you could find the rest of the presence we have on social media, including YouTube and um, Instagram and Twitter, Facebook. We have a page and a couple of groups. Um, and uh, you could find from our, our um, web page uh, where you can, how you can connect to us, um, give us likes, join our groups, uh, uh, communicate with other people who are associated with UNAC. Um, we will be recording this uh, webinar today and 24 hours after the webinar, all those who registered will um, get a message from Zoom and in that message will be the link to the webinar, which I hope you'll share with your contacts and friends and, and others. If you have questions for the speakers, I urge you to put them in the question and answer area, which at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A icon. You can click on that to use that. If you put it in the chat, we're going to miss it because the chat will just scroll up. So put it in the uh, Q&A and area. And I urge you not to get into side discussions. Um, uh, while people are speaking, show people the respect um, uh, uh, that they deserve um, by listening to, to their uh, comments. Um, today's webinar is on the attacks that our movement is experiencing from U.S. government agencies, the FBI, uh, and others, along with the, the censorship that we're seeing. Um, there are other periods in the past where we have our movement, the progressive movement in the United States has been attacked, uh, such as the Palmer Raids during World War I, at which time they um, made uh, laws that disallowed people to be opposed to World War I. The um, uh, post office was uh, given the ability to open people's letters if they thought they might be anti-war. And if there was indication in their letters, if they were saying something against the war, they could be arrested. And many, many were. The famous socialist Eugene V. Debs, for instance, was imprisoned um, while running for president uh, um, because of his opposition to World War I. And uh, he had to run from his prison cell. He still got a million votes, which was very high, especially for that time. Other groups such as the IWW, International Workers of the World, were uh, their entire leadership and much of their membership was imprisoned for the same reasons. We saw the same thing during McCarthyism. And to get out of McCarthyism and to get out of these, it really took a, a movement, a vibrant movement to come together and um, stand up to these attacks. And I believe we're going into a period like that again. And I think our cases indicate that. Uh, I won't be speaking today, but more and more I'm hearing of people who in the movement who are under attack. I myself received from Facebook a message that they were asked to and required to give all my Facebook postings to a uh, um, criminal justice agency. I got back with them and said, which is the criminal justice agency? And they said it was the FBI. So I got uh, a lawyer friend who's dealt with issues like this in the past to contact the FBI. And they said, yes, uh, they do have a case open against me. And they gave her my case number. They said at this point, there is no indictment, but that could happen or, or no charges, but that could happen in the future. The only reason they could um, uh, do something like that is for what I say and what I think, because I oppose this government's policies internationally and locally. I'm against their wars at home and abroad, and they are trying to criminalize that. I think our cases indicate that. So today our chair will give some comments also is going to be Jeff Mackler. 
Uh, Jeff is a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. Uh, he is also on the coordinating committee of the Julian um, Assange Defense Committee, and he is the National Secretary of Socialist Action. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, and um, we'll start the, uh, the webinar. It's yours, Jeff. Thanks, Joe, and welcome, everyone. Today we have five speakers, and we've agreed that each one will take eight minutes. And as the moderator, I will hold up my hand and say, you have one minute left. Uh, after that, we'll, uh, in reverse order for two minutes, uh, in the same order, give the speakers a chance to make any additional comments that they may have left out. If we have time, we'll go to a question period. If you have questions, put them in the chat and Joe will forward them to me and we'll continue. Our timeline is roughly an hour and a half, no longer. <clears throat> and UNEC is sponsoring this meeting because we have always taken the position of supporting everyone's basic civil liberties and democratic rights to express their position in opposition to the policies of the US government. Uh, today, our speakers are as follows. We have Kiana Jones representing the Community Movement Builders and Stop Cop City. We have Akile Anai representing the African People's Socialist Party, which is threatened with long-term jail sentences for opposing US policies in Ukraine and elsewhere. We have Lauren Pinheiro from the Tampa Bay Five and Students for a Democratic Society at Southern Florida University. A group of five students because they were protesting is are faced with felony charges and jail sentences for expressing their political ideas. Next is Allison Bodine with the Alex Saab Defense Committee in North America and the mobilization against war and occupation in Canada. Alex Saab was a well-known Venezuelan diplomat who was imprisoned by the United States for no good reason other than he represents the policies of the government that the United States disagrees with. And finally, I'll be speaking as the uh, steering committee member on uh, Julian Assange's defense committee and for 40 years, I've been the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal, <clears throat> an innocent black political prisoner on death row for most of and in solitary confinement in Philadelphia for most of the last 43 years. So with that, let's begin with Kiana Jones. Welcome, Kiana. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really grateful to UNAC for even convening this particular webinar because assaults on our civil liberties are now running rampant in this country. I am from Atlanta, Georgia, where I now live and work, and I am involved with the movement to stop Cop City. And I am also a member of Community Movement Builders, which is a 501c3 organization that is aimed at Black liberation here in the city of Atlanta. What we have been doing for about two years now, since 2021, is fighting against the building of a militarized police facility here in Atlanta, Georgia. The mayor of Atlanta and the city council decided to come into DeKalb County, um, unincorporated DeKalb County that also shares a part with the city of Atlanta to take 381 acres of forest land. The South River Forest is the largest urban forest in the United States. And here in the city of Atlanta and in the state of Georgia, it is the largest forest. It encompasses the South River, which is the headwater of the largest waterway in the state of Georgia, uh, the Altamaha River. Also, the South River is the second most polluted water system in the United States. It also encompasses the South River watershed, which is very important to DeKalb County because that watershed helps to filter and drain much of the pollution that comes downstream from the north side of the county. The interesting part about this is that this neighborhood where they want to put Cop City is predominantly black. Even with gentrification that has been moving through the city of Atlanta, this particular neighborhood where I was born and raised and where my 90 year old granny still lives continues to hold on 
to its history, to its integrity of nurturing black families. And the city of Atlanta has decided that they want to come and take our public park land, Wilani People's Park, which was also encompassed in that 381 acres in DeKalb County was deeded to the citizens of DeKalb County in perpetuity in 2017. Since we learned about Cop City and the plans for it, we mobilized as a community, as a city, and now as a nation and around the world we have mobilized against Cop City because what Cop City is, is not just a police training facility as it has been dubbed by the powers that be. What it would include is a mock city for urban warfare training. It would also include bomb testing facilities, a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad, an upgrade of an existing firing range um, that is open 24 hours a day already. And it would also include a SWAT training facility. So we're talking about militarized vehicles and weapons in a residential neighborhood. Already in that neighborhood, the neighbors wake up to and go to bed to gunfire. I know, because until two months ago, I lived there. I had to move because my eight-year-old son was so anxious all the time. Every time he heard a loud noise, he had a physical reaction that resulted in him either hitting the floor or trying to hide or just freezing in terror because all he heard was gunfire all the time. And I homeschool, so he heard this from the time he woke up in the morning to the time he went to bed at night. What has happened as a result of the way we have mobilized as a movement is that the mayor of the city of Atlanta, the governor of Georgia and the attorney general have decided that it is in their best interest to le levy domestic terrorism charges against anyone who stands against Cop City because this project is funded and backed by the Atlanta Police Foundation, which we know is made up of major corporations, the very same corporations that have sponsored and backed omnibus voter suppression bills in Georgia, Home Depot, Coca-Cola, Delta, Chick-fil-A, Bank of America, those are the same corporations that are funding Cop City. What has been happening in the city of Atlanta is that they spun a narrative of white outside agitators being against this project. What has happened as a result is that the police have aggressively gone after those who have come from out of town to stand in solidarity with us. We have had incidences one in particular in March at a music festival where police officers can be seen on video running after people and deciding that as they detain people, they are going to check IDs and anyone who had an out-of-state ID got arrested. Those who had a Georgia ID got to be, they were let go. What has ended up happening as a result of these domestic terrorism charges for some, some people were held without bond for the 90 days that is permitted under Georgia law held for 90 days without bond, without bail, without an indictment, and then let go. In the case of one of our comrades, they were held though the entire 90 days without bond, but immediately upon release, he was detained by ICE. So we have a comrade who is now sitting in an ICE detention facility simply because those in power don't want to be opposed. What we see right now is the rise of fascism in this country. It has now become criminal to express dissent against the government, whether it's local, whether it's federal. We see that on January 6th, there were people who were charged with crimes, but not one of them was charged with domestic terrorism. And they actually committed acts of domestic terrorism. What is being shown right now is that not only do we have some very spineless and jelly-backed so-called political leaders, because they're afraid for people to debate them. They're afraid to be called out on their BS. They're afraid to be held accountable when they do wrong in our communities. But what we also see is that they are not going to fight fair. They are going to take what we know to be our ways of democracy and the rule of law and weaponize it against the people who they are supposed to protect. It's already really, really slippery the way the country is moving toward militarization of police. In the United States, we are not supposed to use our own military against our citizens. But what we see happening with the surplus of military weapons, with the surplus of military vehicles, tactical gear, and riot gear being given to local police departments, that is exactly what we're doing. We are using our own military against our citizens 
it's a travesty what is happening in this country right now and in Atlanta in particular. And what we have decided to do as a movement is keep going. Right now we have a referendum petition that we are pushing. And if you can go to copcityvote.com, see how you can plug into our referendum petition um, initiative. And we hope that we continue to stand in solidarity together against fascism. Thank you so much, Gianna. I must say, as a newcomer to that case, I'm shocked at every detail that you mentioned. The total act, government act of criminalizing dissent, trying to demoralize people and threat to put the best of the movement in jail for defending the environment and democratic rights. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Akile Anai. She's an unindicted co-conspirator Conspirator, a member of the African People's Socialist Party that is being persecuted, raided, arrested by the U.S. government for doing radical things like running for public offices as official candidates, expressing their, view, their views against the U.S. war in Ukraine and otherwise fighting for social justice on every front. Welcome, Akile. Uhuru, thank you, uh, Jeff, and uh, also to UNAC, to Joe uh, for the invitation, um, and want to unite that this is a very important discussion um, that we see happening more and more. Um, uh, you know, I see I'm in different like these, and it's great. What is unveiling is a whole movement um, and of uh, masses of people involved in this process who are opposed to what it is that the U.S. government is doing. And we learn that we're not isolated out here in our individual struggles, but that it's connected to one process. It's one ruling class that's focused and struggling to keep this whole social system in place, a social system born, you know, from the slavery, colonialism and genocide of indigenous peoples and of African peoples and has been maintained through the oppression of said peoples throughout the world for centuries. And this whole thing is coming to a head. And um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, I want to just, first of all, recap on July 29th, 2022, which was the um, most obvious, I'll say, assault on the African People's Socialist Party and on the Uhuru movement. Uh, because when we talk about the history of the African People's Socialist Party, we learn that this is not the first time that it's ever been attacked by um, any kind of government entity, uh, the state apparatus that since its inception, uh, which was from the, the Black uh, revolution of the 1960s, uh, that it cert certainly reached a fever pitch in this country, that the African People's Socialist Party is a continuum of that revolution and has the objective to complete that revolution that was crushed militarily by the U.S. government. And that was a war that was happening right here in this country, a whole full assault being made on uh, Black people here struggling for freedom, democratic rights, self-determination. We saw the church bombings. We saw the water hoses on people. We saw, you know, uh, you know, on mass, our leaders being arrested, imprisoned, or assassinated. This was ongoing infiltration, destabilization of organizations, and the, you know, cutting off the lifeline of uh, political leadership to the African masses. And then, of course, the imposition of crack cocaine and a war on drugs being made on Black people in this country who were fighting to be free, fighting for the same things that the African People's Socialist Party has fought for since its inception. And on July 29th of 2022, our movement was met by the FBI um, in simultaneous pre-dawn raids in St. Louis, Missouri and in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, uh, where we have profound history, institutions, and our headquarters and our actual Uhuru houses, our buildings uh, to where we conduct our, our affairs. And uh, they came to the Uhuru house in St. Petersburg, Florida, to my home in St. Petersburg, Florida. And they came to the home of Chairman Amalia Shetela, the leader and founder of the African People's Socialist Party. The man who has been struggling since the period of the 1960s was involved with the civil rights movement and the black power era in this country, uh, started off as a, a leader in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and has dedicated 60 years of his life 
to this struggle and was met with flashbang grenades, with drones, battering rams, armed to the teeth, um, uh, FBI agents. And they were doing this and to seven different homes and locations of our other members as well and of our institutions. And they stole cell phones, laptops, files, archive material, anything that they could get their hands on um, that had any kind of communication or, you know, like history or anything like that. They took it, um, stole it, never saw it, um, have, ha haven't seen it to this day. And this was all to serve a search warrant. And nobody had was even being arrested at this time. The chairman comes out of his home to military assault rifles you know, their lasers targeted right at his chest, letting him know that at any moment, uh, if it, uh, one misstep, he would be dead. And this is the kind of violence that we're, uh, is not new to us. Because again, I just mentioned this whole history, a war being made on Black people by the police in this country, by the FBI, by the CIA, by these different entities and state apparatus that protect the interests of this system were all gunning for us. So we had a familiar, intimate history with this type of, of state repression that we were met with on July 29th. And so um, it took them uh, nine months. Uh, they had, and their their whole, what they said they were attacking us for, which is bogus, is that um, we were being accused of being Russian agents. So it was four of us identified as um, unindicted co-conspirators. And um, based on what was just said in the introduction, because we ran for office, because we spoke at a conference, because we petitioned and said the U.S. government is guilty of genocide against African people in this country, because we raised up the question of reparations to African people. And these were the things that they said was evidence of us working for Russia. When you look at the history of our party and, and greater, the history of this movement, the African liberation movement, we've been taking on these questions for you know upwards of a century or more and that black people since we were forcibly brought to this country have never stopped fighting to be free so that's what we represented and we never needed anybody anywhere to tell us hey you need to struggle to be free you're a slave you got to struggle against a slave master to be free we've never needed any kind of intervention from anyone so it was bogus from the start it was racist to say that black people don't have the capacity to lead their own struggle and to accuse us of being uh russian agents this is what they said and then on april 18th they indicted three of four that they had, had identif identified as unindicted co-conspirators. Chairman Amalia Chatel, the primary target of this assault, Penny Hess, who is the chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, an organization under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party that brings this struggle and our understanding into the white community as also a part of uh, winning solidarity with African liberation and reparations. And as well as Jesse Neville, who is the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, with under the leadership of the party with the same objective to take it out to masses of white people that could be won in this country to our struggle. So these comrades were indicted by the US government on April 18th of this year, nine months following the raids. And now um, on uh, in just 10 days, we'll be looking at the anniversary of this attack on our, our movement. And uh, we've been moving and, and forwarding this counteroffensive because that's what it is. We have nothing to be sorry for. We are not guilty. We are pushing them back. And you know this movement is, is building and I'll be able to say a little bit more about that as we go forward. So thank you, Uhuru. Thank you, Akile, I must say, for your shockingly uh, explosive report on what happens when a long-standing civil democratic rights fighter for self-determination organization dares to use the elections, no less, to propagate its ideas, to defend the rights of all oppressed people and to oppose US wars. You have a courageous struggle? And I must say that UNAC was among the first organizations to come on board. I myself joined one of the dozens of protests across the United States, um, uh, damning the United States government indictments and persecution of the African People's Socialist Party. Thank you so much. Our next speaker <coughs> is Lauren Pinheiro. She's with the Tampa Bay Five and the Students for a Democratic Society. This is a group that is being persecuted by the US government on felony charges 
for actually organizing protests on the Southern Florida University campus. The persecution of students, whether it be students for justice in Palestine or students who fight for all democratic rights has become the norm in this country. We're proud to have Allison, uh, 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 Laura, Lauren with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to UNAC for having me on this panel and for the other panelists for sharing their time with me. Um, as Jeff said, my name is Lauren Pinero. I am one of the Tampa Five and a very proud member of Tampa Bay SDS. For those of you who might not know, SDS was the largest student organization leading the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War, um, and we were refounded as new SDS during the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2006. Um, since then, we have continued to stand against U.S. wars and intervention, opposing airstrikes on Syria, attempted coups in Venezuela, and the U.S.'s support of Israeli occupation of Palestine. We are a national multi-issue progressive student organization standing against not just U.S. wars and intervention, but also police crimes, homophobic and transphobic attacks, attacks on reproductive rights, and so much more. Um, so in spring 2023, Tampa Bay SDS was working on our increased Black enrollment campaign, but we also began to turn our attention to Governor Rod DeSantis and his wide attacks on the people of Florida. Earlier this year, he passed the Stop Woke Act, which allowed him to prohibit how public K-12 schools discuss race and gender. This has led to Florida schools uh, to stop teaching AP African American Studies courses, to water down the history of important Black figures like Rosa Parks, and to ban books like Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye. His intention is to whitewash history and erase the legacy of struggle that led us to achieving our basic rights. People like DeSantis don't want us to know the brutal history of slavery and Jim Crow, nor do they want us to know black, about black liberation movements. They say that teaching these things is indoctrination, but this white supremacist version of history is the true indoctr indoctrination. Uh, DeSantis quickly moved from K to 12 to higher education with his takeover of New College. What was previously an inclusive, progressive liberal arts college became the blueprint of what DeSantis wants for all colleges in Florida. He replaced the majority of the Board of Trustees and began to restructure New College to have it become the Hillsdale of the South, which is a private conservative Christian college. The first thing these new trustees did was actually remove all offices related to or handling diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. So unsurprisingly, his reach extended beyond New College. In January, when DeSantis requested information on students' use of gender-affirming care services on campus, USF willingly handed over that information to him, despite the hundreds of students voicing their opposition to this. When he requested information on DEI initiatives, USF paused its search for a vice president of DEI due to the uncertainty surrounding the laws being pushed by DeSantis' administration. Soon after House Bill 99 was introduced, it's a bill that targets academic freedom on uh, college campuses and could abolish diversity programs, ethnic studies, women's and gender studies, and multicultural groups. And seeing what happened to New College and how our school had already responded to DeSantis's requests, we knew that we had to organize to protect diversity on our campus. So on March 6th, we held a protest where we marched to the president's office on campus in order to get, to get a meeting with her to present our demands. Our demands were quite simple. We wanted the president, Raya Law, and the USF administration to release a public statement committing to defending diversity on campus. And we also wanted them to resume their search for vice president of DEI. We were standing in the lobby of the building, chanting and holding signs, quite typical, uh, for less than five minutes when nearly 15 campus police officers entered the building. Soon after, the chief of police, Chris Daniel, initiated violence, nearly knocking a student over as he pulled her mid-sentence. From there, the officers began to brutalize students, punching them, pushing them into walls, and even groping a student. Four protesters were arrested that day, Chrisley Carpio, Gia Davila, Laura Rodriguez, and Jeannie Kay. They were charged with battery on a law enforcement officer, resisting arrest without violence, and disrupting campus function. Due to the generous amount of money donated and the incredible pressure being placed on the jail from people all across the country calling in, the four were released and um, on bail that same night. So a month later, after continuing to speak out against what happened to us on March 6th and against DeSantis' agenda, I received notice from the school that they had decided to pr press um, academic and criminal charges against me as well. And that is when the Tampa Four became the Tampa Five. Uh, this is proof that our case is political. They had every chance to arrest me on March 6th, but they waited a month. If I had stopped talking to the press, stopped being loud about what happened, I likely would not have been charged. 
The purpose of these charges is clear. They want to silence progressive voices and put activists in prison because we are a threat to their power. This became even more clear when quickly after adding me to the case, they offered us a pre-trial intervention where they would have dropped all the charges against us, but only if we admitted guilt and apologized to the individual officers who brutalized us. We turned down this bogus deal and the state attorney's office responded by doubling the felony count on three of the five who now face up to 10 years in prison instead of five years. Our case and the legislation being introduced in Florida are not isolated from the rest of the country. DeSantis's agenda represents a larger struggle in America. It's not a coincidence that every time he passes a bill, a copycat bill pops up in other states like Texas and Ohio. It's not a coincidence that the same year that he passed the six week abortion ban in House Bill 99, the Supreme Court also overturned Roe v. Wade in affirmative action. Bill after bill, they are trying to rip away the rights that we fought for and won years ago. But with every bill, more and more people are fighting back. DeSantis's attacks on trans youth, women's and reproductive rights, immigrants, workers, and education have led to huge protests across the state, making it clear that the people of Florida do not stand with him or his agenda. This is why we have seen such a large wave of political repression in the state. Whether it's us in the Tampa Five or the Uhuru Three, the Florida Four, the state is retaliating because they are desperate. They know that we, the people, are the ones who hold the power, and if we're not on their side, they cannot win. The case of the Tampa Five could set a dangerous precedent for our First Amendment right and the larger student movement across the country. The state is trying to make an example of us to deter other people from protesting, which is exactly why we cannot stop protesting. When the then Tampa Four were arrested, SDS chapters across the country held protests on the same day. And during our last court appearances, over 13 cities joined in on a National Day of Action to defend the Tampa Five. Seeing so many people who aren't afraid to protest and are not afraid of DeSantis has been incredibly inspiring to see. Um, as we continue through this case with our next court date, which is August 9th, we are determined to turn Tampa into ground zero for the fight against DeSantis. The victory of our case will be a national one, not just for Tampa or for Florida, the people in every state. Lauren, you have one minute left and I'm gonna insist that you take it. <laughs> You can uh, take the minute later, but thank you for your wonderful presentation. And another uh, another comment, it's just a shocking example of what this government is prepared to do if students protest for fundamental issues, for abortion rights, for free speech, for democratic rights, affirmative action, <clears throat> and so on. We're so proud to have you here. Okay. Our next speaker is, and by the way, we have about 125 people with us today from across the country, including people directly from Alex Saab's Defense Committee in Venezuela. We have people from one end of the country to another supporting UNAX webinar. And uh, I'm so glad, uh, as Joe said at the beginning, that the invitation is open to all groups to affiliate with UNAC. We stand for the simple proposition of opposition to all US wars at home and abroad, and for the democratic rights of everyone to free speech, free press, free association, and freedom to organize and criticize. Our next speaker is Alison Bodine. She's with the Alex Saab Defense Committee in North America and the mobilization against war and occupation in Canada. Welcome from distant Canada, Allison. We're so proud to have you here. Thank you very much to Jeff, uh, to UNAC, and to all the speakers tonight. It's really um, an honor to be uh, as part of such a fighting and defending and um, panel that's really standing up for our fundamental rights. Um, I wanted to uh, say as well that I'm here as the coordinator of the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. I'm an author um, of the book Revolution and Counter Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press, and also a member of the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper based here in Vancouver, Canada, where I'm speaking. I'm speaking today from the stolen territories of the Squamish, Tsleil Latouth, and Musqueam uh, nations. And, um, encourage other people to reflect on whose uh, territories that they are joining from here today. Talking about the case of Alex Saab as part of this panel about our attack on our democratic rights, civil liberties, 
which I'll say, by the way, extends through Canada as well as the United States, um, I think is really important because Alex Saab is under attack by the US government for defying US sanctions against Venezuela. And in doing so, defending the people of Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination, rights that extend to all oppressed nations, including those within the United States and Canada. Alex Saab is a Venezuelan diplomat, a businessman and a father who's been held for over three years in detention or in jail in Miami for his work to provide food, medicines and much needed goods to people in Venezuela. He is Colombian uh, and born uh, to parents of Lebanese and Palestinian descent and has been working and living in Venezuela in support of various social development projects that are part of the Bolivarian revolutionary process. Prior to his arrest in 2020, Alex Saab's main work was in securing contracts for the CLAP program in Venezuela, which provides subsidized uh, food and basic supplies uh, to over 6.5 million families in Venezuela. In order to carry out this work, he was appointed as a special envoy or a diplomat in 2018. On order of the United States, Alex Saab was arrested on June 12, 2020 in Cape Verde in Africa, where he had stopped to refuel his plane on his way to Iran, where he was negotiating these contracts. He was detained and held under house arrest in Cape Verde and tortured and denied visits with his family. On October 16, 2021, Alex Saab was kidnapped to the United States. There's no extradition treaty between Cape Verde and the US. The US just came, sweeped him off his feet and has landed him in a jail in Miami. Most recently in December, 2022, Judge Robert Scola uh, denied Alex Saab his rights uh, appeal, um, continued to press charges saying that the US doesn't recognize the democratically elected government of President Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela and therefore the US court system does not have to recognize the diplomatic uh, status of Alex Saab, completely ignoring flagrant violations of his human rights, of international law, and of the rights of diplomats. Alex Saab is a political prisoner. Like so many of the cases we've heard of today, these are political, not legal cases. The arrest of Alex Saab in 2020 in Cape Verde was another attack on the US government's interference, aggression, and war against Venezuela. The entire reason that Alex Saab was appointed to a diplomatic position as a special envoy by the government of Venezuela in 2018 was because of US sanctions and blockade against Venezuela, which cuts Venezuela completely off of, Venice, of international trade. And it was as resulted in the death of tens of thousands of people, 40,000 people as reported um, by SEPR uh, in the United States in just one year. The blockade and sanctions against Venezuela are an attempt to cause people in Venezuela to suffer, to recreate chaos and discontent, and to bring about regime change in Venezuela ultimately, to overthrow the democratically elected government of Venezuela and reverse the gains made by poor and working people in Venezuela in the Bolivarian revolutionary process, which is a flagrant violation of the human rights of the Venezuelan people. The arrest of Alex Saab and his continued detention is significant because it also highlights that the trade between sanctions, sanctioned countries is a significant threat to US worldwide hegemony. The development of economic and trade agreements that are independent of the United States, like ALBA, CELAC, Mercosur, and furthermore BRICS, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization, are a blow against the US government's influence in the region. By arresting Alex Saab, the US government is threatening and bullying sanctioned countries from trading with one another. His detention is also a flagrant violation of the international law protecting diplomats and another example of US government impunity and rejection of international law, which we see mirrored in so much of what we've talked about today within the United States. The imprisonment of Alex Saab is a violation of human rights and self-determination of the people of Venezuela. He's being denied adequate medical treatment, has not been allowed any visits from Venezuelan diplomatic staff which is his right under the Vienna Convention. In Venezuela, every day, 
thousands of people from many backgrounds are fighting for Alex Saab's freedom, led by the Free Alex Saab movement in Venezuela and the leadership and dedication of his wife, Camilla Fabri Saab. In Canada for more than two years, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, and Just Peace Advocates have organized monthly online pickets featuring speakers from the United States, Canada, and Venezuela. And this action has brought together hundreds of people from around the world in a united demand to free Alex Saab and end the blockade on san and sanctions on Venezuela. The next picket action is 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, July 25th. I'll put more info in the chat. I'll also speak later and put more info in the chat about the free Alex Saab postcard campaign from here uh, in Canada, uniting with groups in the United States. And um, I also just wanted to I'll close by saying we have to remember that the case of Alex Saab is proof that the influence of the United States is weakening in Latin America. Like we said, the attacks on people here in this panel and movements is proof that our work is effective, is getting to the United States government. And this opens up more space for people's movements and progressive movements. The United States has not been able to defeat the heroic people of Venezuela and growing cooperation between independent countries is a big defeat and setback for the US. And this includes the improvement and collaboration in Venezuela-Colombia relations, Venezuela-Brazil relations, and the Belt and Road Initiative from China that's been more active in Latin America since 2019. With the United Campaign and United Efforts, Alex Saab will be free. Thank you so much, Allison. And thank you to all of the panelists. I gotta say that as the youngest male on this panel, not counting Joe, it's really wonderful to see a bunch of young women who have the talent, the verve, the intelligence and the dedication to continue this fight and to play the leadership roles you're playing. We're just honored to have you all here. So um, I'm going to speak <clears throat> briefly on two cases. And Lauren, if you have a watch, could you hold up your finger when I have one minute of my eight left? And you'll be my timer. <clears throat> Thanks. I've been working as the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal for almost 41 years. We organized demonstrations across the country to free Mumia that were the largest demonstrations in the modern era with 25,000 each in Philadelphia and San Francisco demanding free Mumia. Mumia Abu Jamal is a classic example of the racist nature of the US criminal injustice system. The United States ranks first in the world in the number and percentage of its population in jail. <clears throat> Mumia is exemplary of the famous infamous school to prison scenario where students in failing schools in poverty stricken community are shunted into low wage uh, non-union jobs, if not the prison industrial complex, which is increasingly privatized and comes close to a slave labor system. The average prison wage, which is imposed by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies that use prison labor is 50 cents an hour. <clears throat> Mumia was the leading critic of the racist Philadelphia Police Department which was indicted by the United States government for corruption, prostitution, bribery, uh, falsifying evidence, and so on. He was a leading award-winning journalist, radio commentator. <laughs> and at the time, the uh, chief of police who became the mayor swore that Mumia was going to be pub uh, punished for his criticisms of the Philadelphia Police Department, which he regularly reported on based on the FBI indictments and criminal activities. They framed Mumia for the, war, for the murder of a police officer, even though there were several eyewitnesses that, that refuted every single aspect of the trial. They prohibited blacks from being in the jury. They violated the US constitution. And it was only after 25 years when we finally got to the Supreme Court that they struck down his 
uh, execution sentence on the grounds that the jury was given improper sentencing. Mumia is a classic example of what is fundamentally wrong with this racist criminal justice system, which is a reflection of the deep-seated problems. The free Mumia, which is the ongoing struggle that we're involved in, requires a mass movement. And it's the same with every other struggle, to free Alex Saab, to free the, to end the persecution of the African People's Socialist Party, to back up the SDS, the Cop City, and all the other struggles requires a united social struggle based on the simple principles of the right to protest. I'm also on the National Steering Committee of Julian Assange. Julian Assange is the founder of WikiLeaks and became well known as a journalist <clears throat> because he released tens of thousands of pieces of classif redacted classified literature on the US war in Iraq. That war was fought by the United States in the name of destroying the weapons of mass destruction of the president of that country, Saddam Hussein. As it turned out, after investigation, including by the United States government itself, there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And yet Iraq was decimated. 1.5 million people were slaughtered. The government was removed. The United States established a government. And Julian Assange had the nerve as a journalist to tell the truth about it. He was persecuted as a whistleblower. And here I will note that just a few weeks ago, another whistleblower, perhaps the model for all of them, Dan, El Dan Ellsberg died at 90, 92, I think, years old in the Bay Area where I live. Dan Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers, which told the truth about the war in Vietnam. The New York Times published the Pentagon Papers and the United States, after long legal proceedings, had to drop the charges on the grounds that free speech prevails over the government's so-called national security. Dan Ellsberg released the information that showed that the war in Vietnam was a liar, and that war took the lives of four million Vietnamese people who were slaughtered with weapons of mass destruction in a US imperialist war. UNAC exists to oppose all of these wars. The wars against Cuba, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Grenada, Libya, Syria, and today Iran, and today Ukraine. Each and every war is a war orchestrated by a handful of trillionaires in order to dominate the world's <coughs> resources. In Ukraine, the example was classic. The United States committing war crimes just last week is sending cluster bombs that are banned by treaties signed by 123 countries to drop on, the, uh, to drop on Ukraine to defend the US coup government a government that the United States imposed in, <clears throat> imposed in 2014 by a fascist-led US-orchestrated finance coup. And when organizations like the African People's Socialist Party dare to tell the truth about the origins of that war, they too are persecuted. As, as UNAC is being threatened by the FBI for publishing the truth about US war crimes. Today, the United States has literally 6 million people in 18 agencies who have national security clearance. Julian Assange was but one, one whistleblower, along with a handful of others who dared to tell the truth. He threatened with 175 years in prison deportation under the espionage for telling the truth about U.S. war crimes. All of the speakers have recounted on different scales the atrocities of the United States government, its denial of civil liberties and democratic rights, not to mention its trillion-dollar annual war budget that wreaks death and destruction on people in the world. So with that, we're going to return to the first speaker, 
And I'm going to ask each of the speakers to give some information about how we may contact you, whether it be your website, your phone numbers, or your emails, and do that in two minutes. So let's begin at the beginning uh, with our first speaker, Kayana Jones, the Community Movement Builders and Stop the Cop City uh, Plan. Kiana. For those who want to stand in solidarity with the movement to stop Cop City, if you want more information, if you want to donate, you can go to communitymovementbuilders.org, defendtheatlantaforest.org, or copcityvote.com to make donations. Um, any donation that goes to either of those three websites will be a part of the larger movement. Um, it will be used for direct actions. It'll be immediately used to help the referendum petition initiative. And um, we know that it's, it's going to the right people. So you don't have to worry about like a third party or anybody intercepting those funds. I also just wanted to mention that people are being targeted as a part of Cop City. Even when they're doing other things, we had a group that went down to Cuba for May Day activities and there were people who had their phones confiscated when they came back by Customs and Border Patrol. So when you think about this movement to stop Cop City, think about everything that was talked about today and understand that this is so intersectional that it all goes together and that all of us are being target, targeted and that none of us is safe from this government. Thank you, Kiana. Next up is going to be Akile Anai from the African People's Socialist Party. Uhuru, and um, we have mounted the Hands Off Uhuru, Hands Off Africa counteroffensive uh, campaign to defend the African People's Socialist Party and the African nation, and to demand the charges be dropped against Chairman Amalia Shetela, Penny Hess, and Jesse Neville. Um, so information, how you can support, you can donate, you can learn more about this campaign, you can join it at handsoffuhuru.org. Um, and also just a couple of events and other developments that I wanted to announce. Um, one, uh, we, uh, the Hands Off Uhuru Coalition uh, was just in the process of pulling together um, a coalition, an anti-colonial free speech coalition to which UNAC um, is, a, is a member organization. And um, so uh, you can learn more about that too at handsoffuhuru.org. And we are really calling on everyone here, um, and, and you can spread this to those uh, that you know as well, uh, about November 4th in Washington, D.C., the Black is Back Coalition hosts an annual Black People's March on the White House. And this year we are, um, you know, parting with the Hands Off of Rue Coalition, the, the freedom of speech, um, anti-colonial freedom of speech movement to descend on Washington, D.C. So that's November 4th, and you can learn information about that at Black is Back coalition.org. We want you there. And on July 21st, there is a film showing fundraiser. And on July 29th is a one-year anniversary uh, webinar um, that'll be happening. So that's um, um, the upcoming Saturday, fr this Friday and upcoming Saturday. And you can learn all that at a handsoffaroo.org uh, slash events. So. Thank you so much, Akile. And once again, join all of these organizations. Uh, get involved, be part of uh, the youth, the new youth rebellion. Join UNAC at unacpeace.org. Our next up will be Lauren Pinheiro from the Tampa Bay Five and Students for Democratic Society. Yeah, there are a number of ways you can get involved and support our case. Um, actually, last month we had a conference, and at that conference we established the committee to defend the Tampa Five. Um, so if you want to stay involved with what we're doing, that's kind of the best avenue. The Instagram is Justice for the Tampa Five. Um, Instagram, that's the Instagram um, at. And then there's also um, a petition that you can sign. It's for both individuals and organizations. It's um, peoplespetitions.org slash uh, Tampa Five, definitely sign that. And if you sign that, you'll get emails with updates about any events that we have going on. Um, as I said earlier, our next um, event will probably be around our court case, which is August 9th. So that's our second, that's gonna be our third pretrial hearing. Um, so definitely stay tuned to see if there's anything going on in your city around that day. Um, you can also call and email the state attorney's office, uh, the 13th district, I believe it is. Uh, State Attorney Susie Lopez, as well as Prosecutor Justin Diaz, let them know that you want the charges dropped. 
Um, and to kind of bring our case to a national level, we're actually going on a speaking tour. So if you would like to host any of the Tampa Five, definitely reach out to me. We would love to go to your city. Thank you so much, Lauren. And now we'll go to Allison Bodine with the Alex Saab Defense Committee campaign in North America and the mobilization against war and occupation in Canada. Thanks. Uh, so I will take this time to announce the free Alex Saab postcard campaign. The Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign <coughs> launched in uh, international co postcard campaign in March of this year and have since been joined by the Anti-War Committee in Minnesota. Um, and we are inviting other organizations in the United States, Canada, and internationally on board. This is a postcard addressed to US President Biden, and it has three goals. It is a pressure campaign against uh, uh, on US President Biden and his administration to free Alex Saab. It's an excellent public education campaign, and it allows for broader participation of different layers of people and organizations in the campaign, including engagement with social media, uh, which we know is important these days. People can take selfies or short videos with the cards while mailing them and post it on social media, or it can be handed out at events and actions. It's easy and practical. And our experience in the last three months has been there's an excellent reception from people and it's a successful campaign. And basically we wanna see an ongoing flow of postcards to the White House to increase pressure. Um, we've already distributed and sent out more than uh, 1,200 postcards to people in the U.S. and Canada, and we'll hope to send out thousands of more uh, to extend the campaign to Latin America and worldwide. I'll put the information in the chat. I think our biggest response to all of these attacks is that we continue organizing, we do consistent campaigns, and we coordinate together. And again, thanks, UNAC, for tying these struggles together. Thank you so much, Allison. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, you can reach the uh, mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal in Northern California by contacting me. That's the initial J Mackler, M A C K L E R, at lmi.net, N E T. And you can reach the Defense Committee for Julian Assange, sign the petition, get involved uh, to uh, free Julian at uh, assangedefense.org. We have a magnificent website. Uh, okay, so with that, I am going to do something unusual. Joe Lombardo, I see you're there. Do you have any questions that we've received from chat that you think the panelists might spend a minute or two on? Um, yeah, let me just ask. First, there was two directed to the um, uh, Cop City uh, protests. Um, one uh, wanted um, uh, an explanation of the referendum that's going on, and the other one, maybe they can be answered together, is are any environmental groups involved in the Cop City protests? Yes, so environmental groups are involved. We have had constant support from 350.org, as well as the Sierra Club. The Hip Hop Caucus, which also does environmental advocacy, is a big part of this movement to stop Cop City. And then we have many of our indigenous relatives who are land and water defenders who have come from across the country to stand in solidarity with us. The referendum petition that we are actively gathering signatures for would allow for a ballot initiative to ask the question about Cop City, where the city of Atlanta residents can vote on whether or not they want Cop City. Because we went to the council and they did not listen to the voice of the people, we decided to use our rights under the Georgia constitution to petition for a ballot referendum. We have to collect 70,000 signatures on this petition in order for the question of the referendum to make it onto November's ballot. We are actively engaged in that process and we are confident that we will get more than those 70,000 signatures required so that the people of the city of Atlanta can have what they never had in this process, which is a vote and a voice. Um, there was a general question maybe for everyone or is the ACLU involved in helping any of these these uh, cases? 
they are not involved in anything uh, in the movement to stop Cop City. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on the breadth of support that you're looking for, that you already have for your fight? I know in Julian Assange's case, organizations like the ACLU have demanded uh, his freedom, as has the New York Times, the British Guardian, uh, the Spiegel publication in Germany, and leading newspapers across the country. To no avail, the United States continues its persecution of the sun. But we're building up a head of steam, trying to build a mass united front movement, which is UNAC's objective, and it's the same objective to defend Julian and Mumia. So any other comments about uh, from the panelists on ACLU, on support you've won so far, on plans to uh, broaden the support, uh, where we go from here? Akile, would you want to give that a shot? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We all heard our hands up. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. <laughs> um... But yes, I can I can kick it off. Uh, you know, I think one, I just want to say that um, what the FBI and the U.S. government intention was when they attacked our movement was uh, to isolate us, you know, and to, you know, make us this weird, uh, you know, untouchable type of uh, group that you have to be afraid of because, oh, they're working for the Russians and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it totally backfired. It was a miscalculation on their part. And uh, what we've what we've seen is the the support that this movement has already had intensified, and that we had we were on a platform now, ele uh, put it on, on an elevated platform by the U.S. government, and people came to us because they saw that we were attacked, and that was that's people's literal comments. You were attacked by the FBI, so we want to join you. We want to be a part of of your efforts, and so um, we've seen that you know just like since the, the raids happened um, and, and since the Hands Off Uhuru uh, uh, campaign actually initiated, we've been able to actually take it throughout the world. So it's an international campaign. Um, just in May of uh, this year, there was an international day of action, 23 um, locations throughout the world, including in the Caribbean, in Europe, and in Africa, and all throughout this country held demonstrations demanding the charges be dropped against the Uhuru Three. And I mentioned this coalition building process that was attended by various organizations from you know different ideological uh, perspectives, but were able to unite around these questions and included you know forces from um, you know uh, the Mexican community, um, uh, uh, Filipino, Palestinian, you know all, all these colonized forces being able to participate in this process. So it's just been overwhelming support endorsements from forces like Charles Barron, New York uh, uh, City Councilman, Jesse Todd, St. Uh, St. Louis Alderman, even Cornell West was able to, you know, uh, come out and say and condemn these attacks that's been made on our movement and so many more. Tucker Carlson was fired <laughs> a day or so after he condemned the U.S. government attacks on our movement. So it's been tremendous. The people, you know, it, we are winning. This is ours. Thank you, Akile. Let's go to Allison Bodine. Yeah, uh, that's a great lead in because that's what I was going to say. I mean, I think these inner these struggles are international. And um, when it comes to the case of Alex Saab, really uh, the overwhelming majority, the voice of people of the world, whether it's seen in different, um, you know, the Human Rights Council in the United States, or in the UN, uh, the UN Commission on Torture, like these united bodies, which represent really a voice of people around the world in opposition to the US are united against the United States in their attacks against Alex Saab and imprisonment and detention of Alex Saab as a political prisoner, but also in the voice against sanctions and blockades, continued um, attacks of US imperialism around the world. And I think um, so many people around the world uh, will also unite between uh, behind everyone that's fighting for civil and democratic rights. It's really great to hear about the international support that folks have received. I know that similar things have happened with Cop City in Georgia. With all of these cases, I think we have to really work uh, to build a, a united front in defense of our civil liberties and democratic rights and extend that completely to co um, political prisoners in the United States. Um, and also hopefully as someone in Canada, I'll say I'm also active in the environment movement uh, with a group called Climate Convergence Metro Vancouver, involved in a movement against pipelines and for indigenous rights. 
you know, we have to work to build those connections stronger too between the US and Canada where these same attacks are happening. Um, and uh, also just to say uh, briefly that uh, the um, National Lawyers Guild has been very involved in the case of Alex Saab, as well as groups in Miami uh, visiting prisoners and, and hoping to get visits with him. Thank you, Allison. And Lauren Pinheiro, you're up. Yeah, um, I like that you mentioned the fact that people were going to Miami for Alex Sop because actually um, one of the Tampa 5 <clears throat> Geo went, some other SDS members went to one of his court cases. But yeah, I mean, we haven't necessarily had direct support from the ACLU, although someone unofficially from the ACLU connected us to our lawyer. But we have seen like a huge wide amount of support, um, even at our conference. There was people from a ton of different groups, um, especially a lot of like labor unions have been getting behind us. Um, so we actually have the North Central Labor, Co labor Council and the West Labor Council that put out statements and resolutions in support of us. Um, so that's been really interesting to see. Um, Representative Anna Eskamani actually tweeted out in support of us. So we're seeing people from the Democrats, from unions, from socialist organizations, from mass organizations come out in support. Um, actually, right before this call, I saw someone from uh, Gabriella, the Philippines uh, organization, it's a women's organization, actually put out a post in support of us as well. So once again, it's like really, really great to see so many people from not only in Florida or in America, but across the uh, globe come out in support of us. And that's how we're going to win. We need people power. We need unity and solidarity. Thank you, Lauren. It's the same with Mumia. If we didn't build a united front, democratic mass movement to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, he would have been executed decades ago. We won the support of 19 international unions across the United States and the world. We won the support of the European Parliament to free Mumia, Amnesty International, the Japanese Diet, the French government named streets through Mumia Abu Jamal outside of Paris, leading to the Olympic Stadium. A lot of this could never have happened unless, unless we built a united democratic organization aimed at mass mobilization. That's UNEC's central purpose. That's why we're having this panel. To get the idea across to our listeners, to people across the country, that the unity in action in the streets is what changes history. When I was a youngster, 65 years ago, I was a student at Antioch, Antioch College in Ohio and I led the first Northern sit-in. I was arrested for, quote, inciting to riot with force and violence. I was rejected from 13 medical schools, <laughs> but, I came in at the beginning of a civil rights movement that mobilized millions across the country to oppose the inherent racist in racism in the American system. We desegregated that barber shop. We sat in at Woolworths. We desegregated all the movie theaters. And in each and every case is because we organized independent mass action. Akile mentioned that um, O'Malley was a member of SNCC, a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I was a member of SNCC as well in 1963 <clears throat> when we organized sit-ins to demand democratic and basic rights across the country. UNEC is planning activities in the, in the coming period. And the question is, what should they be? How can we unite? We're thinking of possibilities like having actions against NATO, which is going to have its summit meeting in the United States, or perhaps a series of conferences across the country that, that have a dual nature, education on the one hand, and planning united activities in cities across the country to oppose all US imperialist wars and attacks on working people. Get involved with UNEC. It's an open, democratic, thoughtful, uh, mass action organization that includes hundreds of affiliates who want to change this world. This panel is a good example. 
So Joe, do we have any final questions for the last round? We have about 10 minutes left. Um, I, I don't have any final questions. Maybe um, uh, the panelists would like to say something. I do want to emphasize what um, Akhile said about uh, November 4th. November 4th, there will be a demonstration at the White House in Washington, D.C. Um, every year, the African People's Socialist Party has organized something there. I've been there in the past and have spoken. Um, but this year takes on added significance because of the attacks on African People's Socialist Party. And uh, I think we should bring all of our campaigns to that rally and really turn it into something that can be powerful because when we talk about a united front, we must um, remember the slogans that the labor movement was founded on. An injury to one is an injury to all. And if we think of um, uh, our actions on that basis, anytime one of us is attacked, we need to come together. Um, and that's that's the way UNAC looked at it. Um, we actually put out a petition for the African People's Socialist Party directed to anti-war activists. Um, it, uh, it's still out there and you can still sign it. Um, uh, which we've sent to many um, government organizations and agencies protesting um, uh, the, the, these attacks. Because we understand that um, if they can succeed with those attacks, they will attack us again. And as we've seen, um, I myself have been attacked probably for similar reasons, because I've also attended um, conferences in Russia um, peace conferences in Russia, and I've been protesting the U.S. policies in Ukraine, as has UNAC, um, since the very beginning. So I don't know if there's anything else that anybody would like to ask or set, make a, a final comment. If not, we can end it there. Uh, let's let's have some wrap-up comments in the same order, starting with Kiana Jones for a minute or two, and then we'll call it a day. Kiana, you're up. Thank you to UNAC for having me for this webinar. I'm very grateful to the other participating panelists. Very grateful for all who tuned in to this talk today. What I would encourage people to do is just find where you fit into the movement because this is all the movement. We are one. None of us can win if we don't all win. And we're not free until we are all free. So we have to make sure that we move forward together and understand that we are not competing, but we are simply collaborating. So wherever you fit in, please get in and do the best you can. Act now, do good, and be the difference. Thank you so much, Tiana. Akila, you're up. All right. Well, I uh, want to express my appreciation to UNAC again, to Joe, to Jeff, to these incredible panelists and the organization <clears throat> struggles that they represent. And uh, we'll quickly just want to say that what we see in the world is an emergence of an ideologically informed uh, and increasingly organized uh, African working class and movements of colonized peoples gaining unassailable momentum. And they're challenging the global political and economic configuration of and we see that the, the ruling class and their system is failing, and that's why they approach us with this type of aggression, with these types of threats. It is not a statement of strength. It is a statement of profound crisis and of weakness, and that they have to move in these very desperate ways, in these very violent ways, in order to maintain a relationship that they've had for centuries, where they suck the blood of people around the world, exploit oppress masses of people where mass people live in you know the worst kinds of conditions and of misery and um, of poverty and oppression that's coming to an end and uh, those who are in power who benefit from that type of uh, exploitation and oppression their you know their their ability to to do that is is increasingly being challenged and also that the same civil liberties that allowed for this ruling class to gain its independence has never been afforded to those uh, who lost their independence by way of slavery and colonialism. But we demand that these democratic principles be made available to all of us, and that if it's taken away from any of us, then that should cause an uproar throughout the entire world for those forces who believe in freedom, democratic principles, um, and, and self-determination. So uh, we you know, demand the charges be dropped against the Uhuru Three, against Tampa Five, against the Stop Cop City organizers, and to all of those who have been attacked by this social system for trying to be on the right side of history. 
We are winning. Thank you so much, Akile. I'm sure that you have inspired a whole layer of people to get involved. Lauren Pinheiro, final remarks. Yeah, thank you once again for having me on. And to all the panelists, you guys did an incredible job, a job and I'm honored to be here. Um, but yeah, I guess I will just say that the Tampa Five were not guilty. None of the people on this call, none of the movements are guilty. We were doing the right thing for protesting what we protested, for organizing for what we've been organizing around. Um, we're on the right side of history, and history will show that later on. Um, I think we just need to keep fighting. We cannot let this stop us. We cannot let this subdue us. Um, and the only way that we're going to win is if we continue fighting, if we unite around each other, we are show solidarity together. As I said, this is all one movement. There are not isolated movements. So get involved in the fight, join an organization, attend protests. Don't be afraid to get out there. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Allison, again, for your inspiring remarks, especially the theme of unity. That's UNAC's middle name. Final remarks, Allison Boudin. That's good. That was Lauren. Yeah, <laughs> all good. Um, so yes, uh, like everyone said, these are united <clears throat> campaigns. We have, when we struggle, we have a chance to win. And all of us are really um, part of this united struggle. It's been just really inspiring <laughs> to be here today, to hear the chat and the questions. We didn't get to all the questions. There's quite a few. Um, so thank you to everyone for participating and to UNAC for organizing and, and Jeff for emceeing. Um, for all of the work that we're talking about, I just want to emphasize uh, that we need uh, what Jeff said earlier, a mass movement. We need to make these kitchen table issues. We need to convince poor, working, and oppressed people in the United States, Canada, internationally, that our civil and democratic rights are precious and something to be fought for, and that we can't stand another minute of these attacks, whether it's the form of sanctions and blockades against oppressed peoples around the world, political prisoners in the US, or uh, the taking away of rights of, of oppressed people in the United States or Canada. Um, we need this united front as a way to build this mass movement. We have so much agreement and unity with one another. We can find these points of agreement on issues of human rights and social justice, climate justice, and we can really work together to build this. So I'm left today with a lot of, uh, you know, hope and inspiration for this continued work and more coordination between all of us. Um, thank you again all for your time and, and free Alex Saab and free all political prisoners in the United States. Thank you, Allison. Uh, the same here, free Mumia, free Julian, free all political prisoners. But let's go a little bit further. Is it just the political prisoners? Are we dealing with the systematic racism that brought 25 billion people in the streets to protest the murder of one innocent person in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Police murders today take place on average of innocent people, black people who have done nothing on a daily basis, if not twice a day, and they're not persecuted. We have the largest prison population in the world, a near slave labor, increasingly privatized system where people work for 50 cents an hour for Fortune 500 companies. It's cheaper to have the government, <laughs> the government pay prisoners to work for corporations for nothing. In the world that we want to build, there won't be prisons. In fact, any healthy, wonderful revolution among the first acts is to open the prisons, to build a society where people can live a free, wholesome, productive, cultural, political, moral life without persecution by racist institutions, by segregationist institutions. So it just free Julian Assange, free all political prisoners, abolish all of the repressive institutions. We are for the abolition of NATO. We are for zero funding for US imperialist wars around the world. That's over a billion dollars a year in the US war budget, and it goes up every day. UNAC has a wonderful website which publishes articles by all of our affiliates. Write it and it'll be on the website, on our website, and it'll go to 30,000 people. 
just yesterday, I finished an article as uh, the National Secretary of Socialist Action on the US use of banned cluster bombs in Ukraine. And it includes a brief history, the truth about the war in Ukraine. Check it out on UNEC's website or check out our website, socialistaction.org. I wanna thank everybody. I wanna extract a pledge that when we have these United Anti-War Conferences, you'll join us on panels for civil liberties and democratic rights. You'll join our effort to build United Front democratic mass action, independent mobilizations to fight for all of the issues that are vital for a free society, a society that we increasingly see escaping more and more people. Thank you so much. Joe, do you have final word? Okay, with that, unacpeace.org, assangedefense.org. You can contact me at jmackler at lmi.net. A special thanks, hug, solidarity to all of our panelists. You're wonderful, you're inspiring, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye, thanks everyone. Thank you.